Welcome everyone. Uh, we're continuing with our second panel of the second day of the European MMT Conference of 2021. And in this panel, we are going to discuss inequality. We have an exciting list of panelists. We have uh, Miriam Rem, who is Junior Professor of Socioeconomics at the University of Duisburg-Essen. We have Professor Dorothea Schaefer, who is Research Director at DIW Berlin. And we have Maurice Hofgen, who is Research Associate for the German Parliament. Uh, Professor of Economics Randall Ray um, from the Levy Institute could not be in this session due to the time difference, but we have a video he sent us to kickstart this discussion. Uh, we will have a number of questions to ask the panelists, and I think that uh, if we keep it to five minutes per panelist per question, we should be able to go through most of them. The audience is welcome to send us uh, their questions by writing them on the comments, and we will include them if we have time. So uh, I'd like to welcome our panelists. Uh, thank you for joining us. And we will begin by watching Professor Randall Ray's video. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak here. In 2005, nearing the peak before the global financial crisis, Citigroup announced the era of what it called the Plutonomy, where, quote, the world is dividing into two blocks, the Plutonomies, where economic growth is powered by and largely consumed by the wealthy few, and the rest. And they projected that, quote, the Plutonomies, the US, UK, and Canada, will likely see even more income inequality, disproportionately feeding off a further rise in the profit share in their economies. Capitalist friendly governments, more technology driven productivity and globalization. In the same year, I wrote a Levy policy brief on President Bush's policies promoting an ownership society, premised on the idea that Quoting Bush, the more ownership there is in America, the more vitality there is in America, and the more people have a vital stake in the future of this country. Bush claimed that access to wealth would be broadened, but I argue that his policies would increase inequality. The true goal was to move all ownership to the very top. We soon crashed in the global financial crisis and watched as millions of people lost their jobs, homes, and life savings. Governments and central banks rescued the plutocrats, while the bottom 99% remained mired in recession. The U.S. barely regained the jobs lost before the pandemic hit. I don't need to show Rick Wolf's famous graph showing stagnant real wages, well, labor productivity, grew on trend since the early 1970s. Or Paulina Cherniva's graph showing that in every recovery since the 1960s, the tippy top of the income distribution gained an ever greater share of growth. After the global financial crisis, the top snatched more than all the gains of the recovery. And it's even worse in this pandemic. The plutocracy has never had it so good. Stocks and financial markets are booming as millions of people die around the world. The richest billionaires are celebrating by blasting themselves into outer space as the rest of humanity watched and prayed that they wouldn't be able to return to Earth. While there, must, while there has been some relief, the pandemic has hit hardest those in the most precarious situations, people of color, women, and especially single moms, faced with the Hobson's choice of staying home to provide care or going to work in dangerous conditions, putting their families at risk. Homelessness skyrocketed around America and is going to get a lot worse with the evictions and foreclosures that are starting up. And as the extra unemployment benefits run out, the pandemic has exposed the fault lines that already existed, both within and among countries. The plutocracy wins and everyone else loses. President Ronald Reagan was fixated on two things, the possibility of an alien invasion and the supposedly evil Soviet empire. These spurred his support for a space-based Star Wars initiative to protect us. However, 
when you took a private walk with Gorbachev, he asked, what would you do if the United States were suddenly attacked by someone from outer space? Would you help us? Gorbachev said, no doubt about it. Reagan responded, we too. Reagan was truly affected. We're all human after all, even those Ruskies, the Cold War cooled. And yet when Earth really was invaded by the COVID alien, as Adam Tooze says, we all circled the wagons, hoarded the global supplies of masks and then the vaccines. Even though we know that in a global pandemic, none of us is safe unless we are all safe. And so we've created a world of haves and have nots at our own peril, letting the alien virus run amok, creating more dangerous strains to break through our defenses. But we don't just face COVID. We live in the era of multiple and interlocked pandemics, climate catastrophe, rising sea level, forever fires, floods of refugees, poverty, homelessness, chronic and long-term unemployment, and rising inequality, racism, fascism, and right-wing autocrats. We face them all, and we face them together. Naomi Klein drove this point home. They are all interrelated, and we must tackle all of them, or none of us is safe. She linked this to the history of capitalism, a system based on exploitation, we're all familiar with Marx's exploitation of labor, but it is not just labor. Capitalism exploits the environment, the family, and the other, that is, other peoples outside capitalism's core. We're taught that capitalism rose out of handicrafts in Northern Europe. Actually, it was created in the New World's slave plantations. It was based on exploiting the slaves and the vast and productive lands of the Americas, as well as genocide of the indigenous population. Europe got rich from the triangular slave trade, modern management techniques developed on the slave plantations, and modern finance that mortgaged the bodies of slaves. We're also taught that capitalism survives because it's the most efficient system, but that's patently false. It's an extremely inefficient system that survives only by externalizing the costs. From the beginning, it exploited Africa, which had to nurture a population until it could be kidnapped, enslaved, and put to work in the new world. It has always exploited families, paying meager wages to the breadwinner and expecting the family, largely the women, to bear the costs of producing and the next generation of workers. Society today, largely meaning the public sector, has to educate, train, discipline, punish, medicate, and incarcerate the population to keep it employable for the capitalists. Society must protect capitalists from real and imaginary foreign threats and it must deal with all the damages capitalism does to our society and our world. Baumol's disease only gets this partially correct. Yes, we nationalize those sectors that have low productivity growth, but more generally, we nationalize all the costs that capitalism doesn't wanna bear. Capitalism has always exploited the environment, gobbling up the free resources, the earth, the trees, the water, and the air. It has never been sustainable. It has always required the frontier, the new territories, the colonies, the cheap labor and natural resources of the developing world. But we've run out. We've nearly destroyed the planet. Society is in disarray. Even the one percenters are worried. They're launching themselves into space to find a new home. I guess they'll leave the rest of us here to fend for ourselves. We might have a decade left to mend our ways. Can MMT help? Let's look at the ways first. Can we afford it? As JFEG Foster said, if we have the resources and the know-how, we can financially afford it. This is the fundamental contribution of MMT. Taking that understanding and closely examining how the government really spends. Second, 
The pay for approach is wrong. We do not need taxes to pay for spending. Tying desirable spending to the ball and chain of a tax is bad politics and bad economics. I know progressives love to tax evil corporations and billionaires, but the tax imposed should be high enough to eliminate the evil, not set to pay for spending. And we should never limit spending just because we cannot find the tax revenue. The main purpose of a tax is to drive the currency, and beyond that, to remove income that generates too much inflation. On both of those measures, the billionaire tax, the corporate profits tax, and the financial transactions tax fail miserably. To reduce inflationary pressure, the tax must be broad-based, hitting the so-called middle class. So I'm skeptical that you can raise taxes on high income and well sufficiently to make a dent in the plutocracy. As Leona Helmsley, uh, who owned the Empire State Building said, we don't pay taxes, only little people pay taxes. But give it a try. How high should the taxes be? High enough to hurt. Set the rate at 120% and get as much as you can. I agree with Rick Wolf, the best path is pre-distribution, not redistribution. Don't let them get rich in the first place. Set limits on compensation, on monopoly gains. Close the loopholes. Impute all corporate profits to individuals and then tax them. And don't let them evade taxes by borrowing against wealth. As ProPublica has shown, the richest pay no taxes at all by using that trick. So all of this is hard to do, but it's worth trying. Seventh, tackle inequality from the bottom up with a job guarantee. A quarter century ago, we advocated a JG with a wage equal to $12 an hour plus generous benefits. Several years ago, we joined the $15 an hour minimum wage movement, raising the proposed wage to 15. That would still fall short in real terms of where the minimum wage was back in the 60s. Dean Baker has just argued that the minimum wage ought to be $26 an hour if it was adjusted by productivity growth. That sounds like a good JG wage. Imagine what the economy would look like if that was the base wage. We need Sandy Darity's reparations plan for descendants of slavery and also for indigenous people. He suggests $800,000 per household, which is the white black gap. Note, this is wealth, not income, which would help African-American and Native American households to start off on more equal footing with better access to housing, schooling, and healthcare. And the rich countries must pay reparations to the rest of the world for genocide, for environmental destruction, for climate catastrophe, for colonization, for hoarding vaccines, and for forever wars. We must give them access to our patents and technology that will allow them to tackle their multiple pandemics. We stand or fall together. To tackle all this, we might need to impose taxes, not to raise revenue, but to release real resources needed to face the pandemics. We will have to mobilize all of our unemployed resources. We will have to release resources from destructive uses like fossil fuel production and forever warring and put them into constructive uses. And we may need to curtail some current consumption. Taxes, postponed consumption, patriotic saving, and possibly some selective rationing uh, can all play some role. We've done it before. In World War II, we shifted half the nation's productive capacity to the war, and we can do it again. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank Professor Rife for that very um, uh, thought-provoking statement. So now we will start with the first question for our panelists. Um, and the first question is, um, uh, so the, the gap between the rich and the poor has been widening since the 1970s, a decade in which significant shifts in Western economic policy were made. When addressing the causes of inequality, economists tend to focus on one or two aspects of these recent shifts. 
in your view, um, what were, are the causes of inequality? And I think if we start with uh, Professor Rem. Yeah, thanks a lot for, for inviting me to, to be here as part of, of this panel. Um, yeah, so for, for me, I'm, uh, and, and, and thanks a lot for the for the interesting and, and as you said, thought-provoking um, statement by, by Professor Ray. Um, for me, the question here really is what we are exactly talking about. I, I really appreciated Professor Ray being very careful in distinguishing between income and wealth inequality, and, and I think this is something that we should carry over into, into the discussion of the panel because it really makes fundamental difference what we're talking about. Now, if you're talking about in, in terms of income and globally, um, then it really, again, depends whether you're talking absolute level or, or relative levels, because um, the, uh, the the absolute number of poor measured uh, in terms of, of absolute poverty lines with all their problems uh, and, and issues that they have has actually been decreasing. The relative gap has been decreasing. So we do see some differentiation and I'm uh, always on, on other panels very careful when people are saying oh inequality has not actually risen it has in some terms it has not in others so in terms of income inequality I think it really depends what we are looking at now what we are seeing is that uh, within country income inequality has been rising um, the especially in the long run uh, secular fall of the wage share if you're looking at functional income inequality the distribution between uh, wages uh, or, or income from work and, and income from capital broadly speaking um, that is something that has been falling in the long run, but again, has been stable since uh, for, for about two decades as well. Now, if you're talking about, and if you ask about the, the inequality here, we can go very much into the details. There's globalization, there's the decline in trade unions. Um, if you talk about personal in income inequality, the inequality between individual uh, income earners, uh, often only looking at wage income or work income, but if we include all income earners, that again at the national level um, has been increasing, has been becoming more unequal. Um, here determines a, a wide varying from in the industry inequ um, inequality that uh, certain jobs in certain industries pay more. Um, that certain jobs, obviously, there's differences in, in, in payment between jobs, and this difference in the education. Of course, there's discrimination. Then the, the issue that is closest to my heart and to my research is wealth inequality. Uh, here, the trend is not quite as clear. On the global scale, yes, uh, Thomas Piketty, of course, has done a lot of uh, groundbreaking empirical work on that. Um, but in the recent decades, it's, it's not quite so sure because the wealth inequality is so much higher already than income inequality. Measurement is, is quite difficult and there's very little administrative data, uh, at least in, in uh, Austria and, and Germany for, for wealth inequality. So uh, the trend is, is not quite clear and it looks like uh, inequality has been largely stable, but the, the level is so high that it's a completely different issue from income inequality. Here you have um, uh, determinants such as differential returns, the cumulative causation pro uh, process that is happening um, where high wealth uh, uh, owners, households is all that we can measure empirically, um, also have high returns on their wealth. So you have uh, the, the Matthew principle, um, he who has shall be given, right? Uh, this, this cumulative causation taking place. And then in, in wealth, the main determinants really um, that we see empirically is housing. Um, so wealth of the middle class really, and, and where that is low inequality is high. That's something that we see in, in, in Central Europe, especially Germany, and also a functioning welfare state. So maybe counterintuitively, uh, we do see that where the welfare state is providing uh, functioning services, housing, education, healthcare, where people do not need to uh, save for, for, these, um, for these contingencies or for, for these um, expenditures, um, that is where wealth inequality is high. Now, if we take a step back from these micro determinants of each of these, um, I would really say, especially now with the 1970s uh, and, and, and your question, the main issue that we're seeing is power. Inequality is determined by power differences, uh, and that is really what is driving all of these. It's driving the functional inequality, income inequality, the personal income inequality, and the wealth inequality. Thank you very much. And then, uh, uh, Professor Schaefer, what do you think? Yeah, thanks for uh, having me. My, I, I would say that uh, we have. Uh, lost our great competitor uh, that is the socialism, at least in Germany, but I also think that is uh, true for the Western economies. We have uh, lost our great competitors on the other side, uh, the socialism and the socialist states, which were there until 1989. 
And and this uh, protected uh, the um, yeah the Western economies or the people in the Western economies to some extent because in the socialism it was clear that uh, all the resources were in in work and uh, and this and uh, there is um, more or less uh, an equal society and uh, because of this. Uh, the Western politicians also aimed for an equal society. And in Germany, for example, we had much higher um, yeah, um, tax uh, rates uh, at the top than we have now. Uh, we have uh, stronger unions. We had stronger unions than we have now. Uh, and uh, uh, I think this is these two issues, um, lower tax rates for the, the high incomes and uh, weak unions uh, is a, a pretty uh, important issue for the inequality or a pretty important cause for uh, inequality. And we also lost a little our, yeah, our focus on education of uh, the broad uh, society. So we we did this in in the 70s, where we really wanted to address all the uh, all the pupils and uh, the people and the broad uh, population uh, and to educate them so that they can more easily earn their their income uh, when they are grown up but somehow we lost this focus uh, in the 80s and and the 90s and we and in particular government spending on education or at all levels uh, it uh, it did not really address the issue that we have uh, a part of the population which are uh, left behind. So I, I think these, uh, uh, the, the lower focus on education, weak unions, and, um, and the tax, uh, the lowering of the tax rates uh, for high incomes uh, are the basic um, reasons for inequality in, in the German society. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Hofgen, what, what would you say about this? Yeah, thanks for having me as well. Uh, I think pretty good points have been made already, so there's uh, not very much to add here. Um, I just wanted to mention one word that maybe describes the shift in power, and that is, well, we just had a uh, uh, era of neoliberalism, um, which came with all of these things mentioned, uh, changes in the tax structure, uh, decline in the power of unions, um, suppressing wages, um, austerity policy as well, because, well, if the government uh, does not spend adequately on its infrastructure, uh, also so social infrastructure, uh, the poor have to make up with their own money. Well, and if they don't earn enough wages, this uh, also likes it's them very hard so yeah i think like in the the decades uh like the the time span from 1970s uh, to today uh we faced uh, very harsh neoliberal policies um and this led to the fact that well both we have a problem on pre-distribution but also on redistribution and the question is now i think how to tackle the pre and the redistribution uh, adequately, which uh, is not a purely economic issue, of course, but is also a social and political issue and an issue of, as uh, Miriam rightly said, uh, of power. Right. Thank you very much for that. And I guess the next question goes straight, um, straight to to the next point, which is uh, how, how do we how do we tackle this? In your opinion, what would be the most important policies that we need to address inequality? Should we prioritize and focus our attention on one or two key policies that can make most of the difference? Or do we need a more comprehensive set of actions to tackle inequality? 
and um, Professor Rem. Right. So um, I, I would definitely say comprehensive, of course. I mean, inequality is a is an all encompassing issue. Um, as I tried to mention, it's not income, in, just income inequality, it's wealth inequality, it's ecological inequality, as Professor Ray also mentioned, it's health inequality. So I, I, I mean, in the socioeconomics department, so I really think we need to conceptualize inequality very broadly. And of course, monetary aspects in our modern uh, capitalist world uh, are crucial to that and, and are key to that, but it, it's a very broad concept. Um, so, so that uh, either or question between comprehensive or narrow for me is easy to answer. Now, which policies um, do I think need to be um, need to be uh, used and applied to to address these issues, uh, these inequalities? Um, I, I really uh, have. I mean, I'm an economist by training, so so that's then where my mind goes again. Um, but um, I do not, I must say, agree with, with Professor Ray in only focusing on pre-distribution. I think it's very, it's crucial and it's not uh, forgotten and, and, and I very much uh, agree with, with Maurice Hofgen that, that this is, um, that both of these aspects need to be um, taken into account and, and, and addressed, um, especially if we're coming from a perspective of power. I, I think it, it's negligent really from a policy, economic policy perspective, if we intentionally lead out individual policy areas. So in my view, um, just as, a, as an enumeration, um, I think on, on the labor market, uh, so income and, and pre-distribution, we do need to ensure, um, I think as Professor Schaefer has, has also indicated, uh, strengthening unions, um, enabling them to raise wages and shorten work time, I, I think would be crucial for, in, in order to, to improve pre-distribution. Um, then uh, on, the, on the redistribution side, which I think is just as crucial since uh, with power, changing the redistribution is also going to feed back into the pre-distribution, right? So all of these are interlinked um, in, in my view. And so if you if you look at uh, government action and, and, and what can be done there, uh, one aspect of course is um, regulatory policy. Um, so the fact that in the 1970s, we still had nationalized industries, again, as Professor Schaefer said, uh, in this competition uh, between uh, two different systems, um, that made a huge difference to then also the wage policies that the unions could implement, right? So, so all of these um, aspects are very in, inter, interlinked. So if we talk about uh, economic policy as it is understood today, proper fiscal policy, on the one hand, of course, you have expenditures, um, right? So what you, in my view, as a, and I understand myself as a post-Keynesian economist, uh, what, you, what would be uh, necessary would be to expand social security, to expand uh, government expenditures, not only on investment, but also on transfers, reduce access restrictions, right? Um, and, and absolutely, especially in, in times of downturn and in, in, in times of stagnation, um, austerity is fatal uh, for inequality. It always hits the worst of, as Professor Ray said, uh, worst uh, women, minorities, um, low-income groups, um, the, the children, the least protected are the ones affected the most by austerity. And right now is a moment where we're in this situation where we're going to soon, very soon have the discussion uh, on the austerity again, and, and it's going to... Uh, if it goes in, in favor of austerity, it, it is going to have these inequality increasing uh, effects, inequalities increasing effects. So this is another expenditure side. Now, what, where I do not agree with MMT is that taxation, in my view, should not be left out of, of this equation. I'm, I'm very much with Professor Shiva in that taxation is crucial for, for inequality as well. Um, uh, Professor Ray is absolutely right. Uh, it's not a cure-all. It, it's not going to fix everything. It's very difficult to push through, as is everything else, uh, because it's a power question, and, and all of these are, are, are resisted, of, of course, by, by those, and that includes, of course, me, privileged by the, by the current situation. So, instituting a wealth tax, uh, expanding inheritances to reduce exemptions, especially that those that had the, the best of and, and, and the, the most well off in, in terms of wealth, um, exempting uh, business um, wealth, is which is concentrated at, at the top. These uh, things, uh, taxes on top incomes, as Professor Shiva had, has mentioned, all of these should absolutely be on the agenda and need to be pushed for in combination with, with other power shifting uh, policies if we want to reduce inequalities. Then in terms of ecology, we want to uh, improve access to mobility, uh, to clean air. Um, we know that um, uh, health, um, uh, uh, clean air is one of the key determinants of, of, of long-term health um, aspects also. Um, so, so these, um, there would be um, other areas where we need to focus our inequality reducing policies. Thank you. Um so, Professor Schaefer, uh, which policies would you champion? 
Uh, I think Miriam Rehm is absolutely right uh, that we should not have or uh, fall back into austerity, uh, austerity policies uh, right now because uh, usually social programs are then cut uh, tremendously and, uh, and the, the poor uh, part of the population is affected uh, the most. So uh, we, we definitely uh, need to keep up uh, spending and uh, to really uh, ease uh, the consequences of uh, this uh, pandemic. And we also should not uh, uh, lobby for uh, for tax cuts uh, cuts again. Uh, so the, uh, in particular in Germany, uh, there is now intense uh, lobbying uh, about the uh, so-called solely Zuschlag, uh, an excess tax uh, for. Uh, which is uh, which is only remaining uh, for the uh, very rich people, and we should definitely keep this uh, extra um, tax uh, on high uh, incomes. Uh, and we see that there is uh, a huge lobbying uh, during the, in the upcoming election um, uh, in in Germany. Uh, to uh, get a, uh, get uh, rid of this uh, excess uh, tax, and uh, we we definitely need to, uh, to go back uh, to education on all levels, uh, and really uh, we should try to uh, to pick up the poor uh, the poor children which uh, do not have any chance uh, to get educated uh, by their parents because uh, they haven't uh, had enough education by themselves. We, we need to, uh, to go back to these policies where we really should uh, want it as, as a society that everybody gets a very good uh, education to be able to uh, earn the income they need for their lives and uh, and there that means a lot of investment in, in the whole education uh, system and uh, we also uh, should really uh, invest a lot in infrastructure because uh, for example uh, public transport. Uh, so the, the disadvantaged in our society, they are really relying on uh, on public transport and uh, having a good public transport system is is key for them to be more to remain mobile. Um, so a lot of investment, public investment is necessary to keep uh, to really uh, repair our infrastructure, uh, a lot of investment in the education uh, system, no further tax cuts, uh, no further tax cuts, cuts uh, keep or try to make the unions more strong, stronger than they are right now, uh, and uh, try to give uh, the workers or the labor more power than they have, uh, than the uh, labor has now. Yeah, that's, I think that's the most important, yeah, um, uh, me measures. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Hoffman, before you give us your, uh, your um, policies, um, uh, there was, there's a question here that I believe is addressed to you and is asking why do you think neoliberalism took prominence at the time that it did? Um, and, uh, you know, because the ideas of neoliberalism had been around for decades. Was it a crisis that allowed this change of ideology? And if so, can we use a crisis to you know, change it again? I mean, that's a question that could feel like a whole evening. Um, it has to do with the crisis that we had, uh, especially like um, the oil crisis and uh, the so-called stagflation. So we had unemployment and uh, inflation um, and the 
beforehand we had kind of the Keynesian era and they kind of failed to really explain and uh, where the stagflation comes from and how to tackle it and then well uh, the neoliberals were very very good prepared very well prepared to take over and then like yeah just pu push forward their agenda um, and are still I think quite powerful today uh, maybe not as much and not as radical as they were in the 1980s and the 70s but definitely still powerful. Um, now about uh, inequality, maybe. Um, I definitely agree with Miriam that we have to be comprehensive. However, that doesn't mean that we should uh, that we should forget prioritization. I think we have to prioritize. And that is maybe where MMT as a lens, not as a regime, uh, adds something new to the table. Because well, MMT shows us that a monetarily sovereign government does not need taxes for revenue in order to spend. However, taxes are super important to drive the currency, to steer the economy, to address distribution and to influence uh, behavior. And if you, if you think of taxes primarily in terms of how much revenue they will generate in order to be then spent again, uh, I think you don't make use of or full use of the tax system. So progressive, as Ray, uh, as Randy Ray also uh, rightly said, uh, love the pay for game, the play the pay for game, and they also love to play Robin Hood. That is, let's go after the rich in order to finance policies for the poor. And from an MMT perspective, that doesn't make too much sense, actually, because, well, we have all the money to spend now on the poor. Uh, today, let's spend on the poor today and tomorrow we can tax the rich because they are too rich and inequality is a, a threat and a burden for democracy, not because we need their money. And if you like apply the Robin Hood logic and you maybe demand a wealth tax of a few percentage points in order to gain revenue then to be spent on the poor, maybe on public infrastructure, education, etc., well, first of all, a wealth tax is not too popular. Um, it is a very harsh political fight. And then imagine even if we like win the fight and uh, we tax the rich with a few percentage points. Well, afterwards, they will be uh, still rich enough to consume, to corrupt and to lobby as much as they did before and not much would be won. So uh, that's not an argument against the wealth tax, but it's an argument for priority prioritize and to put things in the right order because if you wait uh, if you first want to go after the rich uh, before you spend on the poor you might lose valuable time and that's why I think progressives should prioritize pre-distribution uh, as Ron Ray also said and I think the most important thing here is to have an economy uh, an economic policy better say that aims for full employment have a job guarantee run the economy hot um, very high public investments uh, also of course implement a higher minimum wage lower the tax burden for the uh, poor and middle class um, of course then going forward uh, regulate the market to stop the ever increasing concentration of power in the hands of very few companies uh, downsize the financial sector of course but having full employment also increases the bargaining power of unions, uh, of, um, of workers, and that enables them to uh, also like, improve on their situation in the labor market themselves, not just having the government doing something on the tax, uh, tax structure and redistribution. And then once we've regained power, well, we can, uh, I think we have a better bargaining power and bargaining situation to then also demand redistributional policies. But prior to prioritize, I would say, uh, let's spend on the poor today and let's try to reach full employment, uh, like true full employment, not the full employment that we kind of had in uh, Germany, where we still had uh, underemployment uh, and uh, and so on. And in Europe, if you look at the unemployment rates, we have never been under 7.5% unemployment in the Eurozone. That is uh, like, how should unions be powerful when you have 7.5% of the labor force being unemployed? Well, it doesn't work. So yeah, uh, I would say, let's spend money on the poor uh, in order to tackle inequality from the bottom up.
Uh, thank you. And you've you've touched upon an important subject there, which is uh, unemployment in, in Europe as a whole. Um, uh, so I guess um, there was a comment uh, from Stuart Medina about the role of um, the euro in inequality and specifically about how um, uh, the euro structure might prevent some countries to take action to to reduce inequality, particularly in the Mediterranean countries. Uh, what would your views on this is and uh, who'd like to start, shall we say, uh, Professor Schaefer? So, uh, hmm. um, I would not, yeah, see any yeah, fail or, uh, yeah, I I would not really go after the euro as a like, cause for uh, inequality. I think the, the euro uh, is just fine and it really serves uh, the economies within the uh, eurozone and uh, but what the euro so far lacked is um, yeah support from the uh, from the fiscal policy so and, and on an european level or on a um, non-national level. So if the fiscal policy will support the monetary policy, I think uh, then um, the, the currency has uh, nothing to do with, with inequality. Uh, as, as we know that uh, yeah, money is just a veil. It's it is a, a sort of a claim, but really the, what counts are uh, the resources that are in, in an economy. So um, I would say what has, uh, what was missing so far uh, in the Eurozone uh, and also in the European Union was uh, the fiscal backing of the monetary policy and uh, this brings us again back to the austerity uh, policies and these austerity policies cannot be um, yeah, carried on. Uh, so we really need, uh, as uh, Maurice Höfgen also said, we need to uh, employ all our resources in all Euro countries, in, in all European Union countries and also in other economies and uh, in order to really employ all the available resources uh, austerity is uh, is a bad policy so we should really stay away from austerity and uh, keep spending in order to really repair um, our infrastructure our education system uh, our social systems uh, and uh, and then um, and then go go on okay um professor ram do you have any comments on it yeah so, so i very much agree with, with dr shiva that uh, the um, the main issue uh, in in the eurozone was austerity um the structure of the eurozone and of the euro is monetarist, right? It, it is uh, based on a monetarist conception, uh, and in that sense, um, there is something written in the in, into the the structure of, of the setup that is um, um, neoliberal, if you will, or neoclassical in, in in economic thinking. Now, in practice, however, um, the as Dr. Schiffer said, um, the power, and, and again, here we're coming back to, to the power uh, relations, played out m very much on top of this, right? Um, so when, especially in Spain, um, after, after Greece, where you had this very clear um, um, German uh, Troika-led um, uh, stance uh, in, in, in favor of austerity, really um, with a goal of, of breaking the back of a left-wing government that was aiming to pursue moderately Keynesian policies, right? So, so that was a power struggle that, that we saw there and then that played out in favor of neoclassical uh, monetarist conception. When we saw a very similar uh, story playing out in Spain, um, the, the European Commission reports were much more favorable, were, were left a lot of leeway in, act, in, in fact for the Spanish government to slowly grow out of the, the same crisis. 
in order to, to not uh, risk, uh, you know, such a large country um, uh, leaving and and and, and um, really defaulting in, uh, by, by any chance. So, uh, so this is all very much uh, power related, and, and I do think that we have, especially in this crisis, then with the change also at the top of the ECB. Um, to Mario Draghi, uh, we saw a, a, a massive stance in 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 the in the standing in the in the story around these neoclassical uh, framework um, that we have. So there's a lot of leeway. It, it's a question of of really um, pushing through ideas, making sure uh, that this time around, uh, now referring to the to the current crisis, this time around. Uh, 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 austerity does, does not happen. I, I think this is still an, a window of opportunity that, that we are having and, and that is possible within the current rules, with, with the additional rules that were played on top of the debt breaks and, and, and the uh, treaty. I mean, all the time they were talking about the treaties and how they cannot be changed. As soon as there was an interest, there were additional bilateral treaties set up. It's Everything is up for grabs politically because it's a political union and because that is what economic policy is all about. It's not about rules that are, uh, are set in, in, in stone and, and cannot be changed. As the circumstances change, um, the, the views evolve. Luckily, we, we must say in this case, because Europe in, in the last, in the, after the uh, economic and financial crisis 2008-2009, saved itself through austerity into a double dip in contrast to the US. So this was a, a policy-made contraction. Now, I just want to add one more sentence to this because I do think that uh, I totally agree that we need full employment, right? And, and this is the main power shift that we need. I very much disagree that by trying to save the rich, by spare the rich by not taxing them, we're somehow going to get the agreement to spending first. I, I think the power struggle is there and social policies are not going to be expanded because that is not in anybody's interest and the framework is not going to be set in a way that changes the pre-distribution of functional income towards wage income, especially towards low wage income, because that's the same struggle that we have as with taxes. So again, I, I, I just don't agree that this, if, if you spare this one area, somehow the, the, or the, the other things are going to be easy politically, which is not what MMT is saying, but as, as a character, I think that is a little bit what, what is happening and I disagree with it completely. Just because, as I said, that's it. Now, the third point, I'm sorry, another sentence, <laughs> is that really with this full employment thing, the main issue that I see is, and, and again, I totally agree, and, and it's a fundamental power shift that we need, I agree with both other speakers, is the ecological question, right? If we say we want to employ all resources and we want to throw everything at, at growth, right, we are going to have a problem extremely soon. And so I do think that this needs to be very directed um, towards green and pink jobs, and, and it needs to go along with work time reduction in order to increase both the standard of living and the quality of living, uh, the, the time that we have at our hands, because more work for everybody, which in essentially now these, it means bringing the, un, the unemployed and underemployed, and especially that is women in part time, up to full time. And I think what we need to do at the same time is reduce the full time standard for everybody. Uh, any uh, any more uh, sentences? Sorry, I'm done. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, um, Mr. Hoffman, what would your answer be? Yeah, very, yeah, very briefly, maybe. maybe. I uh, agree, first of all, that uh, it's not the currency itself, the euro itself, which is uh, like the arrow, but more or less the setup, uh, as Miriam said, and how we how we use it. But we've seen progress. Uh, we've seen institutional changes, uh, even if it's just soft institutions. We've seen that in the Corona crisis, the January escape clause is activated. The ECB is uh, doing its job. So uh, times have changed. Um, the question is, do will we see a fallback to the fiscal pact and stuff? And maybe strong enforcement. I don't think so. I don't hope so. But well, still like the setup, the official setup that we have, I think is still bad and needs to be improved. And it's neoclassical, neoliberal. Um, yeah, so far on the euro, uh, on the full employment, I think we should better disentangle the question of full employment and how green or how brown or how emission uh, how, how many emissions, uh, how, how environmentally bad our uh, economy is running? Because this is about regulation. Uh, what, ma how do we regulate markets? Which kind of jobs and activities do we allow, and which we don't allow, and which sectors we grow, and which sectors we don't grow? But I don't think we should uh, do environmental policy on the burden of those who then don't find employment. Uh, so full employment 
of course means not throwing like everything at work, but it just means everyone who seeks a job should find a job with decent conditions and decent wages. Uh, and don't employing these people because we think, well, they might spend their income on uh, brown consumption uh, things or something. Uh, I don't think it's a progressive um, progressive mindset, especially because, well, if we want to win people uh, for a Green New Deal, for greening the economy, we have to make them better off. And that's where I agree with you again, Miriam. I, can, I also think that working time reduction can lead, uh, can be part of the puzzle, if you will, part of the package that it's not only about material consumption, but also about like free time and safety and cultural things, etc. So it can be part of the package. But I don't want to play out full employment uh, and like ecological, uh, progressive ecological policy against each other. I think it has to go hand in hand. Yeah. Right. Thank you for that. And uh, just to, uh, I guess, on the point of taxation, um, well, I, I just wanted to clarify perhaps. Um, uh, Professor Ray, um, obviously, he's um, always had this position that we shouldn't link uh, the taxing of rich people to um, to public services. I think that uh, he wouldn't say, though, however, that we shouldn't, we, you know, we should leave the the rich's wealth untouched. I think that he would he would probably even advocate something even more drastic than taxation on that front. Um, so, uh, but on this point of taxation as a means of of uh, funding public services and welfare. Um, I, I believe the position is one of saying the um, that that mixing both of those together makes both objectives twice as hard to achieve, and that we should decouple both objectives and and, and achieve them separately. What would your view on that be? Um, would that, would that be a better approach if if we, for example, in in the UK is is a very and I'm, I'm sure in, in, in throughout Europe, it's a very prominent position to, ta to say tax the wealthy in order to fund public services. Should we decouple both and achieve them and that way make it easier to achieve both of those objectives? What would your, your view on that is, um, uh, Professor Schaefer? Um, yeah, decoupling it might be not a bad idea. Uh, because uh, you could uh, then uh, tackle uh, the equality issue with the taxing the level uh, of wealth uh, or wealth taxes um, apart from the other um, issue that you should pay for social services. Uh, I, I think that would, uh, if you really disentangle tangle these issues also in time, that could help uh, to uh, be successful on, on both. Otherwise, uh, if uh, taxing the rich or the very wealthy uh, in order to, uh, yeah, to finance or fund uh, the social services for the poor, this might accelerate the resistance of uh, the wealthy people uh, on following this uh, or on uh, pursuing this uh, objective of helping the poor. So uh, this might be the case, uh, but from uh, and uh, if you see it, uh, the, the tax issue as a matter of yeah, uh, justification, uh, equality measure uh, or to, a measure to make uh, the society more equal, uh, then of course there is also no need to do it on the same at the same time and. Uh, and uh, to come up uh, or to really to uh, proclaim that uh, the tax, uh, the rich or the wealthy pay for the services of the poor. So yeah, it, it might be not a bad idea to disentangle those two issues. Thank you. And Professor Rem, what would your view be? 
I'm not sure. I mean, this is essentially what the um, um, Central European um, system is doing, social security system is doing. It's a safety net by the rich, uh, by the middle classes for the middle classes, right? It, it's paid for essentially by, by the middle classes. Um, taxation incidence is largely proportional, slightly progressive maybe, but it's essentially um, and and uh, in these conservative welfare states, if you want to think in, in that frame of mind, um, then it's the it's the middle classes that then benefit uh, from these. So this is essentially what we are having, right? We are not making the rich pay for it, in in a sense, right? So I'm not quite clear what this disentangling is helping, right? I mean, there is a power struggle going on at every level. It's in taxation policy, it's in, in regulation policy, it's in spending for social project, for, for, for social services, it's in infrastructure spending, it's in the in the regional distribution. All the time you have these struggles. And I, I really don't see what taking out one struggle is supposed to achieve. Like how, how are we going to gain a, a social contract that suddenly says, oh, but now the, we, we are fine with spending and we'll get rid of the German debt break and, 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 and the European um, uh, stability, growth and stability pact. I, I mean, it's not going to happen just because we say we're not going to tax the rich. On the contrary, um, in the power struggle, if you lose on one side, you lose everywhere. It's not like you get something. It's, it's not the zero sum game. It, it's not like in school, you know, you, you're, you're good and then they're going to give you a good grade and then they're, they're going to give you your, you know, you, you're going to get what you hope for. It's, it's a struggle and, and I, I really don't understand why taking taxation out of the question, what that should achieve in the, in the, in the discussion, right? Because we have the same discussions then at the, at the, um, uh, at the expenditure level. And, and it, it, it doesn't help some, I mean, I don't know, maybe uh, the, it, it, it helps to have new ideas and, and have this new drive and, and we do see it in the US, so I'm, I'm not uh, disclaiming that, that there is uh, something of, of this happening. No? So if there is, and, and, and how I perceive the discussion in the US is you have a new idea that ended at the left, Right, and that sort of pushed the center. Right, so the the traditional uh, Keynesians now suddenly find themselves in the center and, and say, oh, but of course we are going to raise taxes and and, and as well, and, and and we're not going to just spend and, and and I think it's all going to pay for itself, right? And and then this is becomes the new normal, and and, and you have, you know, Krugman suddenly is in, in the middle of the uh, of, of the debate and, and and not the left end anymore, right? So that, that of course makes sense, but. Uh, conceptually, I, I, I think it sort of misses the power element. Yeah, and, and it's this hope of, of you know, it's, it's like literally what Stephanie Kenton says, you know, my super rich hedge fund friends don't want to pay for your kindergarten expenditures. And I'm not going to push them on that. Instead, I'm going to say it's all going to just happen by itself. And, and we can do it conceptually, right? And, and I, I think in a, in a Keynesian dynamic perspective, that is actually the case. You know, if you spend, you are going to generate the revenues, right? So it, this is not a contradiction. I mean, Abba Lerner said that, you know, decades ago, and, and then that's the old discussion, you know, what came first, MMT or, or post-Keynesianism. But yeah. And I think it's a very marginal discussion that we're having because essentially it's the same points that we're making. We're in favor of full employment. We're in favor of an ecological growth. I, I don't believe in putting things in boxes and keeping them there and not seeing the interlinkages. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Hofken, would you have any comments to that? Yeah, uh, I'd like to make four comments actually. The first one is uh, the rich or the powerful uh, don't play the pay for game if it comes to spending on military, if it comes to bailing out the banks or other projects. They are smarter than the progressive who think, well, we have to play as the conservatives wishes us to play and we should always find good pay fors. No, uh, they don't do that. Uh, they don't, uh, Donald Trump doesn't pay for the, his tax cuts and he doesn't communicate in a sense. Uh, they, I mean, they say often, well, it pays for itself. Well, why not use this frame as well? Let's, uh, uh, let's decrease uh, the income tax on the bottom 50% and it will pay for itself. Well, might be actually paying for itself, uh, more likely than tax cuts for the rich, uh, at least. But yeah, uh, just that as a point. The powerful don't play the pay for game when it comes to uh, military spending and everything else. Second, a language point. Uh, the left or the progressives steal the narrative from the conservatives. Uh, strong shoulders should carry more weight. Uh, the rich should 
contribute more to society. Well, if you understand MMT, uh, paying your taxes doesn't contribute like it's not it, understanding the like how the monetary system functions. You see spending money is creating new money. Taxing money is deleting money. So it's not that, well, we need the rich for uh, for the money in order to spend on something. It's not that money grows on rich people. And I think using such frames, such language, uh, just reinforces uh, the conservative framing, which is really much ingrained in our heads and reproduced in media and so on. And unless we kind of challenge this framing, we won't like formulate, be able to formulate progressive policies. Uh, third point, how much do we need to tax the wealthy in order to save democracy, um, have a distribution that the majority of the population perceives as fair or, uh, or sound, right? If we have, we have like policy proposals on the table that are like 1% wealth tax, 2% wealth tax. Well, this won't do much. They will just keep being rich, too rich, so rich that they can consume, corrupt and lobby as much as they could before. So I'm not sure whether it's actually worth like struggling or entering this fight uh, if the result tends to be depressing uh, and we won't achieve much. Um, and fourthly, uh, coupling different uh, policy programs, so spending on poor and taxing rich, if you couple it, you just make the policy package bigger and the bigger it is and the bigger it gets, the more complex it, get, complex it gets and the tougher it gets to uh, bring it through parliament. Uh, Joe Biden, I think, is a good example with its infrastructure program, which should be quote unquote paid for by higher taxes on top income earners. I think something like everyone who has more than 400,000 US dollars uh, yearly income uh, and higher taxes on corporations. Well, it took it took very long. And now like taxes, uh, higher taxes for corporations are off the table because both Democrats and Republicans didn't like the idea and you just lose time. So I think decoupling is a very wise idea and it's also a wise idea to prioritize and to reflect on our language. Sorry, thank you for that. Um, so the next question is, um, despite, so despite continued condemnation of excessive levels of wealth, and we're focusing on wealth inequality at this point, uh, which is held um, mostly by the top 1%. Um, so the super rich continue to proliferate and increase their wealth, even as economic conditions for the rest of us continue to deteriorate. And we've seen crisis after crisis, they seem to do quite well out of all of them. Um, so the question is, how equal a society can we inspire to have when kind of this wealth growth seems pretty uncontrollable? Um, what would your vision for a fair distribution of wealth is? Um, and uh, we'll start with uh, Professor Schaefer. Oh, well, this is a very, very <laughs> difficult question. Um, I... I would say that uh, the minimum requirement for a fair um, society uh, is that uh, people can afford their uh, own lives uh, without, uh, yeah, without really restrict themselves on everything, on clothing and. Uh, uh, so if they want, if they are in work, they should really uh, have a good uh, life uh, and uh, are not should not be required uh, to ask for for additional money. And that would always mean that uh, wages have to go uh, up. Uh, and uh, it uh, and I also see the necessity to really uh, tax the value gains uh, of uh, the wealth of the rich may much more than it has to be the case uh, in the past uh, because those value gains uh, 
really uh, spread, make the, the spread wider uh, between uh, the, the really the top 1% uh, and the rest. Uh, so um, I, um, I cannot really imagine, uh, or I cannot say uh, equal distribution of wealth in the society uh, is, uh, should be the goal. I, um, I really think that this is not achievable in, in the sense uh, that we can redistribute our uh, wealth in that way. Uh, but we can do something about the value gains by uh, using uh, taxes uh, and we can really uh, yeah, uh, provide the conditions that everybody who works uh, has a good life or is able uh, to, to have a good life with his uh, or her wage. And we also have to really uh, do something on uh, yeah, uh, the, the work that is done without uh, payment or without official payment. Uh, so we should uh, bring in more women uh, into work uh, and we should really try hard uh, to do, yeah, to, to avoid uh, unemployment. And, and I do not see that this is, uh, con uh, this is in contrast to, um, yeah, uh, to green goals, uh, because if it is true, um, that we need a lot of uh, investment to really achieve uh, a green society, then of course this in, these investments uh, will provide a lot of work that has to be done and a lot of uh, employment there. So going after or trying to really transform or tran uh, make a transition to a green economy needs a really a high investment and that will uh, guarantee that we have enough jobs uh, so uh, in order to uh, have uh, full employment and uh, I am somehow hesitating uh, to give to give more uh, leisure time to people um, so i am not really fond of redistributing uh, the hours of work uh, because i i also think that a lot of uh, yeah environmental damage is uh, really yeah related to spending leisure time. Okay, thank you. And uh, Professor Ram? Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot for the question. Um, I always hesitate. I mean, I, I would never set an absolute level of wealth that is optimal. I think that is a, a misleading question and, and it really distracts from the debate that we need to be having, like degrowth, like the pay for debate, like the budget deficit, it's the bottom line, it, it happens in the end. The question is, um, which direction do we need to go, right? I mean, that's all we need to know at the current policy state, right? And I think this question can be answered from an academic standpoint, theoretically and empirically. For me as a post-Keynesian, it is we need to go into a, a, a direction of, of a more equal distribution of wealth. And then we can ask it politically, and that's a question of what uh, democratically, what does the majority want? And also an issue that people think that inequality has become too high. So the direction is clear. And then when we're getting to the point where we are divided um, on the academic and on the on the democratic side, or whether the, the level is, is becoming it's becoming too low in inequality, then we can sort of uh, dig it up again, the debate, and, and, and discuss this. Um, so so I, I really think um, that, that this, this would be, um, an, an, for me at least, uh, this is an, an easy question uh, to answer. What I do think is how we get there uh, is the more interesting question. So how can we actually reduce our wealth inequality? And I absolutely agree with Marie Höfgen that a wealth tax is not as proposed and, and as uh, the, the reasonable proposals and, and, and you know politically reasonable proposals that we're seeing um, is not going to shift the needle much on that. 
Uh, my point is, even these small changes is not something that we can push through, right? And that is why it is so crucial to push for them. For me, the debate on the wealth tax, and I'm never arguing it on the, for a wealth tax on the basis for a pay for, because the, the sums that we are talking about are, are as you say, so low that we're we not going to pay for something um, sensible uh, if one stays in that logic and not in a dynamic post-Keynesian logic of, of, of um, expanding production. Um, so that is not an argument that I would make, but I think that the wealth tax really touches the base of capitalism, right? It goes to the distribution of property and property ownership. And that is why we're not even getting close to instituting such a minimal tax that would, uh, that is actually extremely popular. Um, uh, that, is, that is really a misconception. It has uh, very high levels of, of agreement, uh, two thirds, uh, super majority, uh, absolute majority in virtually all service, super majority in many of them. So we're not having the problem that people don't want it. it. The problem is that we're not able to push it through against an elite. And that's why I think one needs to have this debate and also keep it up as a threat potential. I mean, why would you hand over something and stop debating something that is clearly uh, you know, a, a lightning rod for, for, for conservative interests, why would you take that off the table? And so when we're talk, not talking about taxation now, we're receding that topic. I, 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 from a power perspective, I really don't get it. Right. Uh, Mr. Hofgen? Yeah, I can, I, can be, I can be brief on this. Um, I tend to agree with what Miriam said. I think it's more productive to talk about the direction and about absolute levels. Uh, although, I mean, if Bernie Sanders says uh, billionaires shouldn't exist, I have some sympathy to that statement, although I wouldn't put like like a absolute caps on something. Um, so I agree on this one. And I agree also with Dorothea Schaefer that we, when we lift the, the bottom uh, high enough, I think the inequality issue becomes less uh, uh, less pressured and less less important. Uh, although, I mean, psychological research is clear that people tend to compare themselves in relative terms. And as long as there is relative uh, inequality, uh, it still remains an issue, although maybe it's not as uh, important uh, as maybe now. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. And now in terms of, uh, we're going to talk policy a little bit more. Um, so as we know, uh, the mainstream um, way of controlling inflation at the moment is through monetary policy. And that sort of accepts that there is a, a minimum level of unemployment in the economy. Um, so there are some policies out there which uh, are aimed at tackling this um, uh, this unemployment and 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 the um, the poverty that results from it. Uh, one of them is the job guarantee, which is championed by uh, uh, MMTs mostly. And there is other policies as well, like universal basic income, and uh, where everybody gets a minimum level of income, and this is unconditional. Um, and and this is being proposed and trial in some European nations. Uh, so, what do you think of these policies uh, as a means of reducing inequality? And how uh, um, and which one would you favor? So uh, let's start with Professor Schaefer. Um, I didn't get uh, quite the question of, of which one. I, I see one alternate alternative was the uh, uh, job uh, guarantee or the universal basic income or either okay. or both, I, you know. Up to yeah, I, I would certainly go for the job guarantee. Um, and and uh, I, I think that uh, universal basic income um, would have some demotivating uh, characteristics coming with it. So job guarantee, I think people really, it's good for them to work, uh, certainly. And it's good for them to have a, a clear structure of, of their day and to meet other people and uh, and sometimes it, it and most of the time I would say it's also good for for us uh, to um, yeah that we need to come uh, together in a working environment so I am I I don't see much benefits in a universal benefit, uh, basic income. 
Okay, thank you. And uh, Professor Ram? Yeah, so as a, as a post-Keynesian, uh, my policies prescription uh, in, in terms of social policy would be expanding the welfare state, right? Um, so I, I would, um, uh, uh, and, and increasing its progressivity, expanding the welfare state. Uh, I mean, the social uh, expenditures are the, the most progressive tools that we have at this point uh, uh, in, in the government um, option toolbox. Um, what uh, since uh, taxes are, are, are large, the tax systems are largely proportional, slightly progressive. There's not much redistribution happening in the taxation system side. So I would um, expand social service. And then uh, for me, the closest that comes to, to that would be a job guarantee, right? And as long as we're talking about jobs, as uh, Professor Ray said in his address, um, that pay well, that are um, adequately social security, uh, have adequate uh, social security. So I'm not talking about jobs below the minimum wage, as some early MMT works might might have said, or something like that, right? So uh, for me, if we're talking about job guarantee, we're talking about decent jobs. Um, typically, I that that of course will then be government jobs. We try on something like this in Austria, and it worked extremely well um, because, as as Dorothea Schiffer said, um, the, the, uh, jobs bring self worth, right? In a capitalist society. Uh, this is what uh, we define ourselves through work, and, and our self-worth is very much tied to work. So, so that uh, is something that really came out very clearly um, in the, I mean, it was avoided because the, the, the government did change, but the, the uh, Social Democrats uh, actually in Austria instated uh, that, and, and it worked extremely well, as in, in many other trials, because that's so important. I'm also more doubtful with respect to the UBI, um, not because I think people are lazy in here, and here, because I do think that sort of work is in our natures and, and, and we become unhappy and, and depressed. I mean, a lot of religion shows how depressed people are, people are sick, people become physically sick and mentally sick when, when they're not working. So, so I would not be too worried about that. Um, but um, I do think that MMT reaches its limits when we're talking about like doubling the, the size of the welfare state. Right. So I, I do agree that there's some limit of, of this dynamic um, being for itself logic happening. But uh, once we talk about UBI um, on top of everything else and not them being taxed away again in a progressive manner, again, there's very many ways of formulating uh, UBI. But I think the size, the sheer size of it, that would guarantee a basic income that is high enough um, that uh, then uh, really uh, starts running into problems at, at a level where we have this really liberating aspect of UPI, which, which I totally appreciate, where people become free to express themselves to socially worthy work, right? Because most people that we are moving into the labor market are, are women that are now working part time, but not because they're sitting at home lazy or, you know, flying around the world, but because they're taking doing care work at home. Uh, of elderly, of children, um, of, of rep reproductive work, as, as Van Lurie also said. So, um, yeah, and, and from the beginning of the question, it talks about inflation. And I mean, of course, I mean, I, I don't subscribe to Naira. I'm, I'm not a classical person, right? I mean, that's not my theory. Um, and, and I I truly, that that's something that, you know, keeping inflation low through um, through the jobless, through high jobless numbers is really not my, my cup of tea. But um, in, in a post Keynesianism, inflation is post, post push inflation or conflict inflation. Either two, the two. Uh, right now, we are seeing post push imported inflation uh, and, and through supply shortages. And this is what needs to be addressed if there's inflation. But it's not something that we put at the center of our thought. It's not this hyper focus on inflation. Like, you know, we're still below 2% and we're having a debate about inflation right now in, in Germany, which just in, in the US. I mean, it's, it's way beyond uh, anything that's rational. Uh, it, this is, you know, Slightly pathological uh, inflation focus, and not something that we have. <laughs> say. So there can be a substantial expansion of government expenditures in the post in, in my view, uh, we, long before there's inflationary pressures that, that need to start wearing out. Also. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, and Mr. Hofgen, what would you say? Yeah, I definitely agree on uh, what Miriam said about inflation and the debate in Germany and Europe about inflation. I think it's pathological uh, and completely irrational. And I think actually like mainstream economists are really failing uh, the public when they are talking about uh, inflation, uh, especially uh, at the moment. But uh, to the question, um, of course, I am in favor of a job guarantee uh, and I'm not in favor of a UBI. Um, 
for social reasons, uh, societal reasons, but also purely economic reasons. Uh, job guarantee is an automatic stabilizer to the economy. Uh, UBI is not. It's just a permanent program that pays out the same amount, no matter how hot or cold the economy is running. So if we, and I think that's where we all three agree, want an economy close to full employment uh, and with stable prices, then the job guarantee is way more helpful than a UBI program. Um, I really hate uh, the mainstream idea of keeping uh, inflation at bay uh, by, uh, by having a reserve army of the unemployed. So using a buffer stock of unemployed people who then face uh, all of the hardship in order to keep uh, inflation in check. Uh, first of all, because I think it doesn't actually work very well. Um, and secondly, because I think the job guarantee where we have a buffer stock of employed people instead of a buffer stock of unemployed people uh, is a much more liquid and works much, uh, would work way better uh, than the UBI. Uh, also, I think UBI in terms of inequality, actually, uh, it. UBI might increase our freedom in terms of consumption. So it gives some more leeway, democratic leeway even maybe uh, on the, in our consumption world because we can spend the money then on whatever we want to spend on Amazon or the ecological market around the corner, whatever. But it totally neglects the production uh, side of the world. And I think as progressives, we should definitely focus also on the production side and make that as accessible, as democratic and as uh, good um, as possible. Uh, because everything that the UBI can buy, uh, someone has to produce before. Uh, if no one, I, I, that's not, I'm not about to say that oh, once we have UBI, everyone stops working. That's bullshit. But still it applies. And I think it's a social equity issue. Is it okay if someone uh, is able uh, to participate in production, uh, but does not anticipate, but then uses the UBI check in order to, uh, I don't know, access the fruits of the production. I don't think to what extent that is uh, also uh, fair and just. And yeah, in my dystopia, uh, that leads to another important point. Uh, when I think about the UBI, we might end up with a democracy of consumers spending their UBI checks on Amazon and an aristocracy, aristocracy of producers that the products the UBI buys are produced in mega factories around the world with very bad uh, job conditions. And um, here also when we talk about inequality, of course we have to talk about downsizing um, monopolies or oligopolies. So we have a concentration in market power in the markets, in the hands of very few companies, Facebook, Google, Amazon, uh, some car industries, uh, so very powerful. And also liberals, they also talk about the market is functioning well and where we have to, the market, I don't know, the market, the market, the market, is a holy grail. But unless they say that monopolies and too much power in too few hands does not really like fit with uh, a functioning market, uh, I think they're just doing lobbying uh, and speaking in the interest of the few instead of really believing that markets are a better way than uh, maybe some other tools or public tools or something. So uh, having said that, yeah, well, job guarantee uh, instead of UBI and regulate the markets. Okay, thank you very much. And to finish up, I think we have one question from the audience and it is on the job guarantee. It says youth unemployment in Spain is 37 percent right now. Um, do you think that something like the European job guarantee would play a, an important role in mobilizing this potential and then bring us to full employment in Europe? And I'd like to add another one of uh, uh, something else to that question is uh, how close are we to a European job guarantee if it is feasible? Uh, so uh, Professor Rem? Well, um yeah, that's um, that's a difficult question in the Spanish case. No, when once you're at a certain level, um, I think it's, um, it will require more than um, than just a job guarantee. I, I think that needs to be then a broad policy of. Um, I mean, 
also youth unemployment i mean it's a question of do you want to have um, young, young people in work or in education right so, so it, it's I think that that's really something that I, I would tackle in, in a broader a scheme and, and um, try to um, uh, ensure, I mean, the Spanish case is really very high, you know, with the lost generation of, uh, of, of young people during the crisis, uh, lost all hope. Uh, I mean, I have friends living there, and it was really dismal to watch um, how how that really affected people. So I do think a job guarantee is one aspect, but I don't think it's it's the cure-all, it's not the golden bullet that's going to solve um, un youth unemployment or, or, or unemployment in, in general for always, forever. Right? So I, I do think it's, it's important, it is part of the, the power shifting balance, but I do think we need more uh, than that in order to, to uh, ensure that we have full employment. Right? And when I say full employment, um, again, I mean full employment at a lower up, uh, total uh, work hours which lifts part-time employment at the same time, right? Um, so I, I'm, I'm not talking about white men, um, all of them having jobs and all women, uh, or the vast majority of women staying home with the children and, and working at most part-time. And we call that full employment because nobody is choosing to, to work more, right? So um, I, I see this in a, more, in a broader um, way. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Professor Schaefer, what would your views be on a European job guarantee? Um, I, I totally agree with uh, Miriam Rehm uh, that the uh, job guarantee in the case of the youth unemployment would not do the job. I, I think there it would have to be a combination of job guarantee and uh, training guarantee. So, uh, but with so what is really important is uh, that you uh, don't lose these young people uh, for the job market and for, uh, but it is also not uh, the clue or not the best strategy to have them, uh, yeah, transporting meals uh, all the time because that that is really something that, uh, would not um, yeah, uh, give them many, ma much benefits for the future of their uh, working life. So I, I think it would be, it should be a combination of uh, job and training uh, guarantee. And the training could be at all levels. It could be a training that is within uh, firms or enterprises, could be a training that is uh, taught, uh, basically organized uh, by the governments. It could be a training that uh, the universities offer so that you really bring the, uh, the, the young people into occupation. I think that is uh, really, and, and to give them benefits or provide benefits for their future uh, working life. Yeah, that's, that's the best thing I did. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, finally, Mr. Hofgen? Uh, yeah, sure, I agree. Uh, the job guarantee is not a golden bullet. Um, and from my perspective, the job guarantee scheme should be uh, th as small as possible because when it is small, that means the economy is running well and people find higher paying jobs in the regular public sector or the regular uh, private sector. And I think that should be the goal. Um, and that comes, of course, with uh, progressive fiscal policy. Uh, uh, <laughs> also, uh, a good uh, monetary policy, of course, but I think fiscal policy plays a way, way bigger role here because it works more direct um, and can be targeted way better and has, uh, have a bigger uh, influence on uh, how well the economy overall is running. Um, nevertheless, um, a job guarantee really targets the people at the end of the unemployment curve and uh, at the very bottom. Uh, a Keynesian pump priming project where you induce investment maybe and try to get the economy going and get the economy running hot without a job guarantee doesn't really reach the people who are last in the unemployment curve, the long-term unemployed, maybe, uh, and also not the maybe not the 
the youth because uh, untrained youth maybe even because uh, in booms they are hired last and when the economy is cooling down they are fired first and normally they even in the booms uh, booms don't even reach those people so uh, i think it needs a combination of uh, yeah progressive pump priming plus job guarantee it's not a golden bullet but progressives should really uh, lean in on it and fight for a job guarantee um I think it is an important uh, part of the puzzle, part of the package for uh, also greening the economy, uh, decreasing inequality from the uh, bottom up, um, and uh, also enable people, as Dorothea said, uh, to really like uh, structure their life uh, as they wish to. Uh, because if you're unemployed and you're only running to the job center and every time they say, well, we don't have a job for you or please apply for a job and you even know, well, it won't be successful. Uh, that's really depressing. Uh, that's leading to mental disorders. And uh, I think we don't want to uh, put that um, put that hardship on people. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. So we've come nicely to the end of the session. And uh, I'd like to thank the audience for some very interesting comments and questions that you've sent us. And of course, to our panelists for such an interesting discussion. Uh, it's been a pleasure to meet you all. Yeah, uh, it was a pleasure too. <laughs> thank you. With you. <laughs> thank you. And uh, our next panel starts at uh, 2 p.m. Berlin time. So in just, just over two hours. Um, so you can all have lunch and then we'll be back to discuss the Green New Deal. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.